Hello, and welcome to another installment of Grasping Scripture. Again, I'm glad you could join us as we continue to study through God's Word together. And today we'll be picking up in chapter 16 of the book of Revelation. As you've heard me say before, if you've been listening, if you're just joining us or you've you've joined in the last few weeks to come along with this study, I encourage you back up to the beginning of the book. There's a lot of groundwork that you need to follow as we come through the book of Revelation to have a framework for understanding the way we're discussing it. So I encourage you to back up and do that, or if you need to review to do that as well. But we'll be looking at chapter 16. And in chapter 16, 15 set up the the bowls of wrath, if you will, uh, that we find in chapters 15 and 16. Those bowls are going to be poured out throughout uh, verse, what am I saying? Chapter 16. So Uh, As we look at that today, I'm glad you could journey through this, what is sometimes a confusing and for some people a scary book of scripture, but is really given by God for us to have encouragement and to be called to greater commitment to Christ as we seek to live our lives for him. So I'm glad you've joined us for this study. I welcome you. Now let's turn to the Lord in prayer and then we'll turn to his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. We do thank you. You have blessed us in so many ways. And Lord, you are victorious. And you have included us in that victory. As we have come to know you as Savior and Lord. You have called us your own. You have declared us to be the redeemed of every nation, every language, every tribe. Father, we thank you for the incredible gift of a right relationship to you in Christ. That as we read this account of what will happen, Father, that we can read it knowing that we rest at ease in your hands and we stay committed to you. No matter what rages around us, you are our Lord and our God. And we thank you for that. Now, Lord, as we study your word, help us to have insight and wisdom. Help us to glean from it what you would have for us, that we might hear your voice speaking to our hearts as we seek to follow you. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, starting in the chapter 16, again, we're, we're dealing with the, if you will, bowls of wrath um, or the seven bowls. This is the third, if you will, the third retelling of God's judgment upon the earth, culminating in that great and terrible day of the Lord. Uh, we saw it through chapters six and six through eight, giving us the seven seals, the latter part of eight through 11, giving us the seven trumpets. We took a little break in 12 through 14 to expand that, that part about the scroll that John is given to eat that takes place, um, in chapters 10 and 11 that's expanded out in 12 through 14. Now we've made it to chapters 15 and 16, which deal with that third retelling as, as we're looking at this structure of revelation, that third retelling based around again, the plagues of Egypt, um, on God's judgment on the earth, on the beast, the false prophet, and on Satan and on humanity that had rebelled and rejected God. So we're seeing all that take place here. And there's there's a whole lot that happens in verse or chapter 16. There's only 21 verses. I believe that's right. It's 21, isn't it? Yes, there's 21 verses. Wanted to get that right. Um, only 21 verses there, but we cover a lot of territory in those 21 verses. So what do you say we go ahead and dive in in verse 1? So chapter 16, verse 1 says this. Then I heard a mighty voice. Now, this is John speaking, because this is all vision given to John, told to write it down as a circular letter for the churches. That'll be important in a minute. We'll come back to that. Then I heard a mighty voice from the temple say to the seven angels. Now, these are the seven angels. Each one has a bowl. Go 
your ways and pour out on the earth the seven bowls containing God's wrath. So the first angel left the temple. Now this is the heavenly temple, the throne room of God, left the temple and poured out his bowl on the earth. And a horrible, excuse me, and horrible malignant sores broke out on everyone who had the mark of the beast and who worshiped his statue. So there's the first bowl poured out and it's this bowl of, of sores of these malignant, uh, horrible malignant sores. I mean, as if malignant sores isn't horrible enough, we actually get the descriptor in scripture, the horrible malignant sores. Um, this, this is kind of gruesome. This is meant to be painful. This is meant to be, um, off-putting as we even hear about it. This is part of God's judgment on humanity that had rejected him and chose to worship the beast, chose to worship evil, the Antichrist, to worship Satan functionally and reject God. And we're going to see something as we go through these judgments as they're poured out. Uh, a difference in chapters 15 and 16 versus the other uh, chapters 6 through 8 or, or 8 through 11, the seals of the trumpets, the response of the people to the seven bowls. The people that the judgments and the seven bowls are directed at are those who worshiped the beast. Now, there's only two groups. There are those that worship the beast and those who refused and took the name of Christ, the name of God on their forehead and know him as Savior and Lord. Those are the only two groups. These judgments in these bowls of wrath are all being poured out on those that worshiped the beast. It's made clear that that's who the target of this. This is retributionary justice being delivered out from God upon those that have martyred his followers, upon those that have rejected him and embraced evil. Now, that may be an uncomfortable thought for us because in our modern world, we like to, we like to pretend that evil is just a perspective. I mean, say, we would never do that. We believe evil's bad. We did... Yeah, but we preach tolerance. Well, I don't preach tolerance, but our society preaches tolerance and and that everything is okay. You know, that's just your perspective or your story. We've jettisoned the idea of absolute truth, of of an a standard outside of ourselves and our own judgment for what's right and wrong. And the reality is God the creator of all that is, the creator of the universe, God, his character and his nature define for us what right and wrong is, what good and evil is. And it's not really up for a vote. It's not dependent on what we think of it. It is the reality that is. We can choose to reject that reality and live in some sort of a delusion, or we can live within the bounds of that reality. But we don't get to change that reality. That's a hard pill for a lot of people to swallow. But that is the truth. And what we see here is those that have rejected the truth and embraced a lie. They have been taken captive by the lie of our enemy, of Satan, and have worshipped him. And now they are facing the consequences of that worship. Whereas in the seven seals and the seven trumpets, the calamities came upon some, you know, a third or whatnot of the earth was struck with. Here in the seven bowls, it's poured out on all who worshipped the beast. So that's a bit of a change in the account there. So that first bowl is, is those horrible malignant sores. And that's, that echoes the plagues of Egypt. So the second and third bowls, both of them were water turned to blood. Again, plagues of Egypt. Then the second angel poured out his bowl 
on the sea, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and everything in the sea died. Now, if we're understanding the context here, that this this great nation, economic power, military power that's being described as Babylon, and the mark of the beast 666 is, is actually Caesar Nero, uh, or possibly what was viewed as a reincarnation of Nero as Domitian, If that's the framework we're operating in, this would definitely make sense from John's perspective because Rome's might was heavily dependent, its economic might was heavily dependent on sea travel. Um, Rome had managed to eliminate most of the threat of piracy. And so most of their economic goods and, and revenue was generated by shipping, literally shipping on the seas in ships, not the way we use it today where it could be trucking or trains or whatever, but by actually using boats, shipping. Um, So when you say everything on the sea died, uh, fishing industry gone, shipping industry not going to work. I mean, it's just, yeah, it would have hit them hard on one of the things that was seen as being one of the powers and strengths of this unholy trinity that the people had chosen to worship. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and springs. So we've hit the seas already. Now we're hitting the rivers and springs and they became blood. And I heard the angel who had authority over all water saying, now before we get hung up on that, the angel who had authority over all water, there seems to be, we don't have it delineated out anywhere. There, I'm sure there are groups that have put together their own ideas on the hierarchy of what angels are responsible for what, but God has apparently delegated responsibility for certain areas of existence, uh, those tasks pertaining to those areas to be carried out by certain angelic beings. Um, I heard the angel who had authority over all water. So, you know, obviously there's one of them. But listen to what he says before we start going, ooh, do we need to know more about this angel? No, we don't. Here's why. You are just, O Holy One, who is and who always was, because you have sent these judgments. You see, these angels, we don't need to focus on them because they only act at the will and direction of God. It is all about God. They do not act under their own power, their own authority, or their own ability. They act as envoys for God. Our focus needs to be on God, not the angels. Don't get hung up on that. Because even that angel who has authority over all water is proclaiming, you are just a holy one who is and who always was. Notice we've dropped the and will be because this is it. Because you have seen, or you have sent these judgments, since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is their just reward. We may go, wow, where's the loving, forgiving God? Right there. What God does is just if for no other reason than by the definition of it's God doing it, and he is the definition of just. I say, well, it sounds harsh. It's actually very much in line with Roman or even Hebrew legal thought. Uh, The Roman concept of, of lex talionis. It's, it is retributionary justice. It's if, if you killed, you deserve to die. And that's the pronouncement here. Since they shed the blood of your holy people and your prophets, you have given them blood to drink. It is their just reward. In other words, it is what their actions have earned them. And he goes on in seven. And I heard a voice from the altar saying, yes, O Lord God, the Almighty, your judgments are true and just. Remember the um, the voices from under the altar, those were the, the voices of the martyrs. And here we have this almost uh, antiphonal chorus. We've got the angels proclaiming 
God's praises and God's justness. And then we have the, the voice from the martyrs, the voice of the altar calling out, echoing it and affirming that message. So we see that playing out again there in the throne room of God. So that brings us to the end of the second and third bowls at this point. So we've covered the first one, which was the sores, the second one, which was the ocean turner, the seas turning to blood and everything in them dying. And then we get to the third, the second one, the third one, which is the rivers and streams, the freshwater sources all turn to blood as well. So that gets us to that point. Now we're going to transition and begin to look at the fourth one. And it's a little different. So let's take a look at it. The fourth bowl of wrath does not echo one of the plagues of Egypt. And it's it's the aberration here because all the others do, whether it's sores, blood, fire, darkness, even, even bowl number six, which we'll get to in a minute. It's got some frogs associated with it. So that even sort of echoes the bowls or the, not the bowls, the plagues of ancient Egypt, Moses, Exodus. But bowl number four is different. And so it bears noting because it varies from the theme. Let's read four. It starts in verse eight. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. There again, everyone, not this is everyone that worshiped the beast. All of them are affected, not a third, not just a portion, not just some, all. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, causing it to scorch everyone with its fire. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat, And they cursed the name of God, who had control over all the plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. We didn't see that in the other three bowls. It's with bowl four that we start having this, what was the effect type of comment. In bowl number four, we have the scorching of the sun. Everyone was burned, uh, not to death, but to agony, if you will. Everyone was burned by this blast of heat. And what was the response? We've got God's judgments being poured out on humanity, on those that had rejected Christ and had worshiped the beast and taken the mark of the beast. everyone burned by the blast of heat, their response was not to call out to God. Their response was not to repent. Their response was that they cursed, this is the last half of nine, they cursed the name of God who had control over all the plagues. They did not repent of their sins and turn to God and give him glory. In the face of God's judgment, they dug their heels in. Starting to experience the consequences of their sin. They just cursed God for it. Instead of repenting and turning to him. They refused. There were two choices, and they made their choice, and they're holding to it. And so both four being an aberration in that it doesn't follow the plague motif of of the Exodus account, it's also a shifting point, and we start having this consequences, this, and how did the people respond when this plague hit? And so here with the fourth bowl, They did not repent of their sins and turn to God to give him glory. Now let's see what happens as we go to bowl number five. Then the fifth angel 
poured out, this is verse 10, then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and his kingdom was plunged into darkness. So here, the judgment in bowl number five, the judgment of darkness, uh, that gets poured out on the throne of the beast. I mean, this is this is like evil central here. We're going to the core of the problem. His subjects ground their teeth in anguish, and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores. But they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. So here again, the seat of the enemy's power is ground zero for this plague of darkness. And we're talking like plague of Egypt. It's not just dark outside. It's black as pitch. It is, I can't see my hand in front of my face dark everywhere. His subjects did what? Got mad at the beast because he wasn't fixing it? No. They take their anger out on God and they cursed the God of heaven for their pains and sores because they still had the sores and all the water was still blood and yeah, and they were still burned by the sun and now they can't see anything and they blame God. They curse God. Why are they experiencing all this? Because they rejected God. And the implication here seems to be that, you know, maybe they could have repented. They don't. And that's the point. Not one of them. They don't. But they did not repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. Now, one of the nice things about us in our world right now, we still have opportunity to repent and turn to God. Many of us have and have come to know Christ as our Savior and Lord. We have received that gift of God, of salvation, of a right relationship with Him, of the promise of eternity. But there are many in our world today who may have been taken captive by the lie of the enemy, but it is not too late for them to turn and repent of their evil deeds and turn to God. He forgives. He restores. He heals. He makes new if we will turn to him. But there's coming a day when that turning won't happen. There's coming a day when facing the consequences of our sin, humanity will lash out at God instead of taking ownership of their sin. And this brings us to kind of another transition point, if you will. Um, I mentioned earlier that when we got to bowl six, there were going to be some frogs and, and frogs were one of the plagues in ancient Egypt. So there's that connection there, but it plays itself out in a very different fashion here. Let's look at plague number six. It says, then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great Euphrates river and it dried up so that the kings from the east could march their armies towards the west without hindrance. And I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They are demonic spirits who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world to gather them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God, the Almighty. So this is that great battle in preparation um, for, for judgment day. This is that moment where the curse that is poured out is the curse that the Euphrates dries up. And you may go, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like much of a curse. You just removed an obstacle so that the armies of the enemy, the armies of the beast could gather and march against God. How is that a curse? Wait for it. 
You'll see it in a moment. But wait for it. This is a portion of scripture that so many people hang so much on. This is, and I'm, I'm going to go ahead and use it because when we get to bowl seven, we're really into it. Um, actually, the latter part of six, even we get into it. This is Armageddon. Yeah, I don't mean the movie about the asteroid. This is this is legitimate biblical Armageddon. Okay, this is where the reference comes from. This is what, oh, it's the last days, it's the end of days, it's Armageddon. This is the passage that talks about that. Now, what's the significance there? We'll unpack the historical significance, the geographical significance in just a moment. But understand this curse that is poured out, this bowl of wrath being poured out that causes the Euphrates to dry up, in the history of Israel and in the thought of first century Mediterranean world, in the thought that John would have had and the readers of Revelation would have understood, the Euphrates was that obstacle that made it difficult for the nations, the kings, the city-states, whatever, the empires, from across the Euphrates, from the, the um, Mesopotamian area, to march in and attack Israel. That had historically been the case, or at this point, come in and attack Rome. Now, there wouldn't have been indication and thought. I know some modern readers want to look, okay, the Euphrates dries up, so that's preparing all these nations that worship the beast. That would be India and China, Southeast Asia. They're all going to march across because the Euphrates is a... Um, that would not have even entered the mind, okay? The the Indus River Valley and on in the China was not considered a threat to Israel in the first century or prior to that. This would have been Mesopotamian empires, Babylon, Assyria, groups like that. So we kind of read into the text if we try to pick a modern nation or group of nations and say, oh no, this is them. Good luck with that. I know people do that all over with the book of Revelation. There's multiple places where they want to say, this is America and this is, is Russia and this is China. And this is, you're playing loose and free with it when you do that. That is not how John would have understood it. It is not how the first century readers that this was clearly directed at, as stated in the earlier chapters, um, would have understood it in any way, shape, or form. This is a gathering of all those that are opposed to God, and the obstacles to their gathering have been removed, and that is part of God's judgment on them. And you might say, how is removing the obstacles part of God's judgment? Here it is. It says, I saw the three evil spirits, or I saw three evil spirits that look like frogs, this is verse 13, leap from the mouths of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, that unholy trinity. They are the demonic spirits, or they are demonic spirits, who work miracles and go out to all the rulers of the world, gathering them for battle against the Lord on that great judgment day of God the Almighty. So they're coming to battle God, but on what day? The judgment day of God Almighty. Look, verse 15, look, I will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Now, what is this voice that is speaking? This is a voice from the throne of God. This is now God weighing in. The, the bowl, number six, has been poured out. The armies are allowed to assemble. And God says, look, I will come unexpectedly as a thief. Blessed are all who are watching for me, who keep their clothing ready, so they will not have to walk around naked and ashamed. It's that warning that the day of the Lord is at hand. Be ready. You don't know the hour or the time. Be ready. How do we be ready? We be right with God. We know him as Savior and Lord. We follow him with our lives. We don't spiritually fall asleep like the church at Sardis. We don't 
lack proper clothing like the church at Laodicea. Instead, we stay awake, we stay alert, we stay prepared, ready, clothed for travel so that when God says now, we're ready. Yeah, there's echoes of the Exodus after the Passover to eat the meal with your the hem of your garment tucked up as if you're ready to run so that you can be ready. Uh, he's preparing the people for what was to come. Here, God is reminding those that believe in him that his day is coming. Be ready. Don't be slacking off. Don't be neglecting to follow him or to be right with him. The opportunities at hand make the most of the opportunity. So that's all kind of packaged in there. And then we get to verse 16. And the demonic spirits gathered all the rulers and the armies in a place with the name or with the Hebrew name Armageddon. Which is actually a phrase that means the hill or mountain of Megiddo. The hill of Megiddo stood at the end of the Jezreel Plain. The Jezreel Plain was a main thoroughfare through the... the um, Carmel Mountain Range. Um, it was, well, it was the site of many battles. Uh, Pharaoh Necho killed one of the Jewish kings in that valley. Um, there are some great battles throughout Israel's history that took place on the Jezreel Plain. They're just down from the hill of Megiddo. So it's, it's a place throughout history where these pivotal battles have taken place. Now we have the judgment being poured upon the beast and all those that follow him. He's allowed to use this, this demonic miraculous power to convince all those that follow him to stay with him, to gather a symbol at the Jezreel plain there at the foot of Mount Megiddo or Hill Megiddo, Armageddo for the battle of Armageddon. And they have shown up and they are ready to do battle with God at Armageddon. And that's where bull six ends. But pay attention to what has happened. The armies have gathered. They are there at the hill of Megiddo. But... We then shift to bowl number seven. Let's look at number seven. In verse 17, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a mighty shout came from the throne of the temple heavenly temple, throne of God, saying, it is finished. Where have we heard that before? The final words of Christ as he hung on the cross, atoning for the sins of the world, defeating death and hell, said, it is finished. Here, the armies of evil are assembled to do battle with God there at Megiddo on the Jezreel Plain at Armageddon. It's this battle, or actually in truth, it's this preparation for battle. But when that seventh bowl is poured out into the air, God's judgment, remember those bowls are his wrath, his judgment upon those that have rejected, his judgment poured out into the air. When that happens, a mighty voice comes from the throne of God in the heavenly temple and declares, it is finished. It's like, wait a minute, the army is assembled out there on the Jezreel plain. What do you mean it's finished? It's finished. Listen, verse 18, then the thunder crashed and rolled and the lightning flashed and a great earthquake struck the worst since people were placed on the earth. The great city of Babylon, again, when we're reading Revelation, Babylon is referenced to Rome. 
The great city of Babylon split into three sections, and the cities of many nations fell into heaps of rubble. So God remembered all of Babylon's sins, and he made her drink the cup that was filled with the wine of his fierce wrath. And every island disappeared, and all, all the mountains were leveled. There was a terrible hailstorm, and hailstones weighing as much as 75 pounds fell from the sky onto the people below. They cursed God because of the terrible plague of the hailstorm. They don't get it. Their hearts have become hard to God. They are so entrenched in their warped and evil thinking that they cannot turn to God, will not turn to God. But this great battle that we talk about, this, this battle of Armageddon, do you see what happened? They all gathered to do battle with God and God looked at him and went, it's finished. Boom. And the earthquakes and the lightning and the thunder and the, the islands are gone and the mountains are leveled. I mean, it is like full force judgment of God pouring out here. And it looks kind of ridiculous if you step back and you look at the situation where the nations gathered in this locale on this, this plain at the foot of the, the hill or mountain of Megiddo to declare their intent to do battle with God. They show up ready for war and God looks at them and goes, we're done. It's over. It's finished. It is actually the, the Greek term they're used for, for it is finished that we translate into English as it is finished, uh, is more, it is complete. It is whole. It is done. It's not just it's finished. Well, I finished that task. No, it, there's, there's an all-encompassing idea to its completeness, its fulfillness, fulfilledness, if you will. Um, so all of that is is going on and is the undertone here. And that's, that's bowl number seven. We start seeing day of the Lord dawns when the enemy was ready to do battle with God. And I, it's just on all of this is awe inspiring, but it's awe inspiring to me to just, you know, you get to that part, that seventh bowl poured out into the air. And then from the throne of God, you just got, it is finished. God has won. God won when Jesus uttered those words on the cross, declaring it's done. The victory was won then. And the sky went dark and there was an earthquake and thunder and the veil in the temple tore from top to bottom. And there was no longer any separation between God and man. As Hebrews reminds us, there is only one mediator between God and man, and that is Christ Jesus. Um, we gained the ability to be made right with God through the atoning work of Christ on the cross. The victory is already won. And we have at this point, the opportunity to repent and turn to Christ if we don't know him. And if we do know him, we need to live for him, not fall asleep in our faith, not be unprepared in our faith, but be living for him daily. That's what we are called to do. That was the message to the seven churches to return everything from return to your first love to endure because the victory has already been won to do not fall asleep. Do not give up. Do not let the soil of your heart grow hard and unproductive. Put on the clothes of righteousness. Live right before God in reverence and worship to him because we do not want to be counted in this group we do not want to worship the beast and we don't want it to be said that when the hailstones are falling from the sky 
We don't want it to be said of us, they cursed God because of the terrible plagues of the hailstones. They acknowledged it was all coming from God. They refused to acknowledge that it was just judgment because they did not repent. They weren't being judged for what they had done, although it was consequences of what they had done. They were being judged because they did not repent. If you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord, you have the opportunity to repent. Take that opportunity. Be made right with God. Call on His name. And Scripture says if you call on His name, you will be saved. Turn to Him. Place your faith in Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. God has provided that avenue for your salvation. In John chapter 3, it tells us that Christ didn't come into the world to judge the world, but to save the world because we stood condemned already by our sin. We're all sinners. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned against him. We all deserve hell for eternity. That's the reality because our sin makes us guilty. We earned it. But God in his love for us has provided salvation, forgiveness for sins, has said he will make us a new creation in his sight. Not only that, he will give us his very spirit living in us to guide us and shape us more and more into the image of Christ so that we reflect him more and more in this world and we can live in right relationship with him throughout eternity. Take the opportunity to turn to him today. Accept his forgiveness for your sin. Repent. Turn from who you were and live in a right relationship with him. Don't be like these most pitiful people who embraced worshiping the beast, who rejected and rebelled against God. And even when his wrath was being poured out, their response was to curse God instead of repent and turn to God. Don't be them. If you know Christ as your Savior and Lord already, then this this chapter is cause for rejoicing. It is cause for rejoicing because it speaks of the joy that is found in Christ, the joy that is found in right relationship with God, that we can celebrate his victory, his justice, not because we want to see others tormented, but because we know that we serve a just God who is a loving and forgiving and merciful God as well. He is our creator and our Lord and we follow him and that the victory isn't in question it's already been won on that afternoon on the cross the victory was won so even as our world thinks it has power as the devil thinks he has an army that he can muster and stand against God when it comes time for the battle there is no battle there is a proclamation from the throne room of God. It is finished. And it's over. So, as I study this passage, I kind of start thinking, you know, this whole battle of Armageddon thing is a misnomer. It is Armageddon. It is the gathering of the army of the beast at Armageddon. But it's not a battle. It's already over. Doesn't that inspire confidence in our Lord? Assurance in our faith? The victory has already been won. And we've been invited into that victory. I thank you for joining me. As we journey through this study together, I hope that you find the book of Revelation to be an encouragement to you. 
now as we've rounded out chapter 16 and we've we've uh, gone through the seven bowls of wrath we're going to shift gears a little bit because revelation takes a little bit different tone as we look at 17 through 22 Uh, but our next section we're going to look at more intently is is the fall of babylon what is involved in that what does it represent how is that related to us and that's chapter 17 through 19 so appreciate you joining me as we pick up next week to look at chapter 17 of the book of revelation let's turn to the lord in prayer heavenly father we do thank you we thank you that you are a just and a merciful god we thank you that you have not that you haven't called time on us yet that you are still giving opportunity for the lost in this world to come to know you, to repent and find salvation. And Father, you are calling us as believers to stay faithful, to stay true, to stay alert, to stay clothed and ready for your day, because we have the promise that you are coming. The victory has already been won, and you are coming to claim that victory on that great day of the Lord. Father, help us to live our lives now in sight of that day. Thank you for your word. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.